Hello and welcome. This is NT Tuesday Live and I'm Cyril Stober. Our constitutional amended amendment is not new in Nigeria. It is a universal practice that empowers the legislature to repeal or enact provisions of the law that may be seen as obsolete or fall short of addressing contemporary challenges. The ongoing amendment process today is giving attention to critical issues around legislative and judicial autonomy and other delicate legal frameworks needed for the smooth running of governance at national, sub-national and local government levels. Tonight, NTS Tuesday Live will look at the recent amendment process by the National Assembly and the State Assembly's legislative exercise and expectations from the clauses under scrutiny. But before we go into the discussion, let's see this report put together by National Assembly correspondent Lami Ali. Following the inauguration of the Senate and House of Representatives committees on the review of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, several submissions were received from stakeholders and interest groups as the ninth national assembly proceeds with the exercise which seeks key reforms for improvement in local government administration the judiciary electoral matters the legislature security and gender inclusion the two committees met to harmonize reports before submission as we critically consider the bills in the working document for us in which the Secretariat has provided both the Senate and the House versions. Let our debates, opinions, and decisions on the, amend on the amendment and, and expressive process be guided by what is best for our people and what is in national interest. I'm seeking for maximum cooperation from all of us so that we can deliver. Bills that made provision for state police and immunity for deciding officers of national and state houses of assembly were rejected at committee levels. The Constitutional Alteration Exercise climax on Tuesday, 1st March 2022, as both the Senate and House of Representatives voted on 68 bills. In the end, both chambers said yes to financial and administrative autonomy for local government areas as they approve abolishing of joint accounts. Bill number one, 2022, local government financial autonomy. The service colleagues, the results are there. Yes, 92 senators. No, two senators. Abstain, zero. Total, 94. Clarity is passed. Bill seeking movement of airports, railway and correctional services from exclusive to concurrent lease were approved, including the bill granting power to states to generate and distribute electricity. The separation of the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation from that of the Minister of Justice and the bill separating the Office of the Accountant General of the Federation and that of the federal government were approved. The lawmakers also approved the bill granting power to the National and State Assemblies to summon the President and State Governors. Other fundamental provisions that were approved are the establishment of a National and State Council of Traditional Rulers and the bill seeking inclusion of former presiding officers of the National Assembly as members of the Council of State. 
attempts to put to rest recent disagreements on who takes charge of value-added tax between federal government and states through constitutional duration suffered a setback as lawmakers voted against its inclusion in the exclusive legislative list. Also rejected is the bill seeking to provide pension for presiding officers of national and state assemblies and four gender-related bills. One week after the votes, the House of Representatives made a U-turn on three of the rejected gender-related bills dealing with citizenship, indigenship, and the 35% affirmative action for women as the House recommitted the bills for reconsideration. There are issues arising therefrom, and the House, in its wisdom, has decided to take a course of action for the good of the country. The two chambers will, in the coming weeks, conduct voting on another set of constitutional alteration bills and forward the state assemblies for concurrence. From the National Assembly, Lami Ali, NTA News. All right, that report sets the tone for our discussion tonight. Let me go ahead and introduce our guests. I'd like to welcome to this program Senator Ibrahim Hadeja. He is a member of the Public Accounts Committee and member of the Constitutional Review Committee. Thanks for joining us, Thank Senator. Thank you very much for having me. All right. We have here tonight also Mainasar Akugo Umar. He's a lawyer, economist, and public affairs commentator. Always good to see you with us here. He's always happy for me to be here to Thank contribute for the nation. Let me also welcome to this program Abu Bakr Sadiq Jallu, he is Chairman, Committee on Judiciary, Jigawa State House of Assembly. He joins us from our Kanu Network Center. Thanks for being with us tonight. Mr. Siri. All right. And uh, also joining the discussion tonight is Dr. Abdul Fatai Sambu, Associate Professor, Department of Public Law, University of Illini. He specializes in constitutional law and constitutional justice. He joins us via Zoom. Thanks for being with us on NTA Tuesday Live. Many thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to be here. Right. Thank you. Well, at the appropriate time, you can get to be part of the discussion in the studio. When that time comes, we'll refresh your memory and tell you the procedure. Uh, but uh, we always remind you that at that time you can call in. Uh, there are certain things we expect you to take care of when you do call in. But for now, let's go straight to the discussion and we can start off tonight by looking at those issues uh, in uh, the overall national interest and uh, those matters that are deeply concerned with amending Nigeria's constitution. And uh, we'll start off by uh, speaking to the distinguished senator here with us and say, tell us a little more about this overriding national interest that has, you know, demanded that we take a second look at Nigeria's constitution. Well, I think, uh, you know, it, it, the constitution itself provides for its amendment. So uh, it is a process, uh, in, 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 it's a democratic process that uh, paves way for uh, a dynamic constitution that changes with the times, you know, that changes when uh, uh, exigencies are uh, uh, so called for. So, uh, you know, once you get this clamor, it's a lot, we've been hearing a lot of uh, clamor recently, people want state police, some people don't want it. Any issue that uh, really cannot uh, uh, be amended or be uh, uh, dispensed with by a simple, uh, you know, law uh, or that clashes with the constitution, then of course you, it calls for a constitutional amendment. Uh, that being said, the process is very rigid because, uh, you know, you don't want to introduce frivolity in something as serious as uh, your ground norm, which is the, the, the main law that uh, where, from where all other laws uh, derive their power. So it provides for its own amendment. It's a rigid process. And it's a process that I think uh, happens almost uh, in every regime. Some successful, some not so successful. And, uh, you know, this time around in the Ninth Senate, I think uh, 
uh, most of the uh, amendments uh, were far-reaching. And uh, I think also the difference being that uh, uh, the, uh, public, uh, the public hearing process was, was very wide. And uh, you know, I participated in the zonal public, uh, process, uh, public hearing and the one in Abuja. And surprisingly, from what we heard from the public, you know, uh, it was quite uh, revealing. A lot of the uh, areas where we thought would hear, you know, they don't want state police, maybe because of the security situation. Uh, a lot of the northern states actually demanded for state right. uh, police. So, you know, it, it threw up some surprises. And, uh, you know, we, we came back, we, 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 we put our heads together, we did the harmonization. And uh, until it culminated in what you saw happen about two or three weeks ago, where at least uh, in the Senate, out of about 68 uh, bills, individual bills. And again, another peculiar uh, thing is that uh, to avoid what happened in the seventh uh, assembly, where it was condensed into one bill, which the president uh, didn't sign. So, you, you know, he, he threw out the baby with the bathwater. This time around, it was individual bills that were presented, each on its own uh, standing. So if, if, if one dies, it doesn't affect uh, uh, the others. Okay. And uh, we are now at the stage where the ball is in the court of the state assembly. Uh, we we'll wait and see how these things fare. All right. Um, I mean, as a, you, you've been a keen watcher of the process, and you do know, of course, that um, over time, uh, Nigerians have uh, called for amendments. So many issues cropping up in, in, uh, in, in the Constitution. So what's your take on this latest effort? <clears throat> yes. Um, every country is like a body system. Every body system is a reflection of its own spirit. And... Uh, the spiritual component is the determinant of the picture and the functional operations of the body system. Uh, the country, any country you see, whether Nigeria or anywhere in the world, its own spirit is the constitution. And the constitution is a dynamic document that normally propels as a reflection of the demands, interests and aspirations of the citizenry over a given time. Uh, there are successive efforts uh, by national assemblies uh, right from 1999 to date to succeed in amending this constitution. Uh, we have seen a lot of budgetary exercise, uh, so much money will be voted for for constitutional exercises. It ends up as just mere uh, political jamboree because at the end of it we have never seen this type of remarkable uh, dedication and dexterity in amending the constitution as we have seen done by the ninth national assembly i must commend the national assembly really for standing firm with the interests as aspirations of the people going owing to the fact that under sections 14 of section 1 sovereignty belongs to the people and the true and con 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 uh, 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 serious representatives of the people when it comes to getting in touch with the minds of the people uh, the legislature the legislature under sections 4 11 8 and 9 of the constitution uh, the repository authority with, uh, that have the authority to tactical with the constitution as demanded by the people. And they have succeeded in doing it this time around, especially in the novel idea they have brought of taking the, the exercise to the grassroom, to the grassroom, taking it to the citizenry, people deliberated upon it. We have seen 68 areas that uh, they have touched. Uh, it is... Uh, uh, my humble optimism that uh, those areas will be widened uh, before the end of the exercise so that okay. we will benefit from so many more important areas. Because when you are amending the constitution, it is a panacea to social, economic, political and whatever problems be developed the nation at a particular time in history. Okay. Thanks. Thanks so much. Then let's go over to our Kano uh, Network Center and speak to... Uh, uh, the chairman of uh, the chairman on judiciary, Jigawa State House of Assembly, uh, the Honorable Abu Bakr Sadiq Jallu. Well, now the National Assembly has done its bit, and uh, you heard the senator say the ball is now in your court. What can we expect this time? That um, the state legislature and the National Assembly are on the same page? Uh, because if you recall past experiences, uh, it ended up in huge, huge disappointments. Uh, Mr. Cyril, uh, I would like to say that the state uh, legislatures are very ready 
this time around uh, for this uh, constitutional amendment. And uh, going by what happened or what transpired at the National Assembly, I can say that uh, we are very ready and we await for a transmission to the State Assembly. And we'll do the needful, we'll uh, do our duty uh, according to the yearnings of our people. And uh, as you already know, that by virtue of Section 9, uh, there are two stages that are involved uh, in amending constitution. The first stage is the what happened at the National Assembly, while the second stage is what happened at the State Assembly, whereby uh, at least two thirds of the number of states assemblies uh, need to approve uh, such amendments before they become uh, into law. So we are very ready and we will do the needful and we will follow all the legislative processes and see that what we do is in line with the earnings of our people. Uh, this time around, uh, permit me to just press a little bit further. Um, you, you've said you do what is in the best interest of uh, your people. Um, at this point, many Nigerians will say, well, they would hope that uh, the usual thinking that um, state legislatures are usually, um, you know, speaking with the voice of the governors who are in those states, uh, Nigerians would be hoping this time around that there wouldn't be such a maneuvering anywhere uh, because, uh, let's face it, there are times they have said, look, it would seem as if um, uh, the governors are the puppeteers behind the scene. No, Mr. Cyril, I assure you that uh, uh, this time around, uh, we'll do what is needful and we'll do it uh, without uh, interruption or intervention of state governments. For example, let me state uh, categorically clear that in my own state, uh, we, I can see we are independent to some extent in terms of uh, administration and even to some extent financially. Because uh, in 2018, we passed what is uh, called uh, the Gas State House of Assembly uh, Funds Management Law, whereby, to some extent, uh, the House is independent. And administratively, I can say we are independent because uh, we have our State uh, House of Assembly Service Commission, whereby we independently perform our duties, we do our own appointments without the interruption of the executive. And I can assure you that uh, in Jigawa, at least where I, I am a member, I can see we are that independent and our governor uh, already has given us that political will. He doesn't interfere because uh, I can see this because uh, so many things happened. Even by virtue of signing that particular bill into law, the independence of the uh, state assembly, I think that is uh, the way, uh, that is a very good way to show that uh, he supports the independence uh, of the State Assembly. And since uh, the passage of that particular law into law, I doubt much if there is any time whereby uh, from the House we send a request for release of funds to the executive governor. We do that uh, to the Office of the uh, Accountant General in line with the provision of that particular law. Thank you very much. We'll return to you with uh, some of the other issues. But let's go over to Dr. Abdul Fattah Sambu, who joins us via Zoom, uh, the Associate Professor in the Department of Public Law in the University of Illinois. Well, uh, here we are with uh, what has been seen as um, the most ambitious and serious attempts at addressing the numerous uh, issues that have uh, bedeviled uh, governance, particularly the constitution of the Federal Republic. What, what are your thoughts about this? Uh, thank you very much. Well, I agree with you that uh, this is a very ambitious process of actually giving Nigerians uh, a constitution of our choice. But I would have loved a situation where the constitution would be truly autochthonous, at least the constitution would be truly homegrown. At least it will actually emanate from the people of Nigeria. And it's only when the constitution is homegrown and truly emanates from the people of Nigeria that we can only justify the preamble to the constitution, which says, We, the people of Nigeria. Again, if you look at Nigeria, since it's uh, for a very long period of time, Nigeria has gotten about eight constitutions. And uh, 
of course, the, the Clifford Constitution of 1922, the Richard Constitution of 1946, the McPherson Constitution of 1951, the Lititi Constitution of uh, 1954, the uh, 1960 Constitution, the 1963 Constitution, the 1979, and of course, the 1999 Constitution. This uh, 1999 Constitution has actually gotten about four alterations. And uh, please, I would like to use the word alteration instead of using the word amendment. Because if you look at section nine of the constitution, it talks about the mode of altering the constitution, not mode of amending. And uh, even though it may be a matter of semantics, but uh, uh, we would like to stick with the language of the constitution, which uses the word, uh, the mode of altering the constitution. Now, if you look at these constitutions I've mentioned so far, uh, it's either uh, a product of uh, the military or perhaps uh, what was uh, actually bequeathed to us by uh, our colonial masters. So be that as it may, one would have wanted a situation where the constitution would be truly autochthonous, and there are so many advantages of having a constitution that is truly autochthonous. One, it will even allay the fear of uh, the fact uh, the fact that uh, we are saying maybe some governors may want to uh, veto it, or perhaps there will be also also of assembly of states who would like to look into the. I mean. Uh, follow the steps of the governor because this will actually emanate from the people. And there are two ways, two major ways in which a constitution can truly emanate from the people of Nigeria. It could either be through a referendum or through uh, concert assemblies that we had in, the, in 1979, uh, 1979. So if a constitution is not uh, truly, it does not truly emanate from the people of Nigeria, then there's a problem of legitimacy. And when you talk about the problem of legitimacy, it also leads to a situation where many people will not have respect for uh, the code document called the constitution. And the constitution by its nature should have some level of sacrosanctity. It should be, it should have some level of inviolability so that people would, it's different for ordinary lawmaking. And that is the reason why he enjoys, uh, the, as it is now, the National Assembly cannot even which means that they can continue to order. And that's why we're having the first alteration, the second alteration, the third alteration, the fourth alteration. If you look at the fourth alteration alone, it contains about 3,000 words, which means that we are adding more volumes to the constitution. We have about 320 sections. Compared to an American constitution that is even up, up to about 30 pages, compared to a UK, because UK does not even have, uh, UK is a country that is uh, practicing essentially an original constitution. So, if we got the situation, we don't want to get a situation where the, uh, our constitution will be so voluminous and it will not get to a extent that we have to make sure that we include every single thing in the constitution. It, 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 it will be so heavy. Would, so the what, 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 would that surprise it. you? Um, yes, we're, we're, we're trying to do all these things and your worries about uh, overloading the constitution. But you yourself have just talked about uh, a homegrown constitution. And by saying homegrown, I'm thinking you're looking at the peculiarities of this part of the world where you might not have the kind of thing you have in the UK, which is a, largely a, an unwritten constitution. You see how the, what, even a written constitution, the, the kinds of heated debates it generates anyway. Yes, you see, the, if you look at when I say homegrown, it means that the people of Nigeria must be allowed to have say, because if you look at section 14 of the constitution, of the section one, the sovereignty belongs to the people of Nigeria. And you see, when the constitution is truly homegrown and uh, when Nigerians actually participate in the making of the constitution, it may, not, it may not essentially be through a referendum, but it could be, it could be through uh, what we call uh, concert assemblies. And members of the concert assemblies will not be appointed. They must be elected for that purpose. If you look at what happened during the period of uh, 2014 confab, as beautiful, as intelligent as uh, uh, th those members of uh, that particular confab uh, were, they, 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 it's lacking in one fundamental. And the fundamental is legitimate because the people in that particular cover were not elected. And if you are not elected for that particular purpose, then the, the issue of legitimacy, and we cannot actually claim that this particular constitution actually emanated from the people of Nigeria. You know, otherwise, right. uh, and one other thing, one other advantage of having this particular I mean, constitution that would truly emanate from the people of Nigeria is that it, it, will, it will give, uh, apart from legitimacy to the constitution, it will give respect to the constitution 
and the question will go through a process of what we call popularization because many people will be aware of the content of the of the constitution as it is now not many people are aware of the content of the constitution and a constitution is a, is a document a fundamental rules and regulations that upon which the state is all i mean all to be governed okay so if all right all right, we'll return to you because you have raised some very fundamental issues. And um, uh, right straight away, uh, Senator uh, Ibrahim Hadija here would, uh, you know, address some of these fundamental issues you, which you have just raised in addition to looking at specific areas uh, that have been uh, contentious issues even in the past, like the local government autonomy, uh, the question of state police and, and, and many others. Let's, <laughs> let's go to you. Well, uh, Cyril, you know, I, we, we, we heard a lot of this during the public hearing, people coming to question uh, the legality of the constitution or offering us uh, fast track methods mm -hmm. uh, to amend it. You know, you know, like I earlier said, the constitution itself provides for the way it's to be amended. And uh, there's nowhere in the world where uh, an amendment of the constitution is simple, because if it becomes frivolous, uh, then uh, you probably have uh, a constitution that you wouldn't recognize after maybe two or three years. Uh, I remember during the uh, uh, public hearing in Abuja, you know, a lawyer, senior advocate, came to tell us that, uh, in fact, uh, the constitution was uh, illegitimate and that uh, all of us were just uh, wasting our time. And this is somebody who has been practicing law since 99, quoting this same constitution on behalf of his clients, making a lot of money. Uh, you can't issue a cake and have it. It's the constitution we have. It's a constitution that uh, has now produced uh, nine governments. It's a constitution under which I was elected as senator, and I swore to an oath to uphold and defend it. So, you know, when people start talking about, uh, you know, referendum, it's not in the constitution. You know, I, I wish it was. Uh, what, I, what I think uh, people should do is try to participate in the process, uh, you know, follow it through. You know, we had the public hearings. Uh, we are all represented by people. We had to go home and, uh, you know, consult and, and, and on, on a wide range of uh, amendments to find out what uh, uh, my own constituents feel about it. And that's why it's thrown back at the states, just to be sure that, uh, you know, it's gone back to the grass which is grounded in... Uh, uh, the, the fact that uh, another set of elected officials uh, will sit down and uh, pass it through. It's not by accident that uh, the process is rigorous. Uh, you know, if, if you look at the number of uh, the clamor for state creation, if we allow that uh, uh, to be a simple process, we'll probably, probably end up with, uh, you know, six, seven hundred states uh, in Nigeria. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it's the constitution that we have. Uh, and, 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 it, and it contains, uh, you know, it's the ground norm. It's what gives everybody the legality to do what it's doing, the judiciary, the executive, the legislature, uh, and so on. And I don't think, uh, you know, people have been bashing the constitution, uh, left, right, and center. I don't think it's that bad. A lot of what I've seen is that uh, a lot of the constitution, you know, we haven't even tested it. Right. A lot of the provisions haven't even been put into practice. And yet uh, we are quick to say that, uh, no, let's have a new constitution. And everybody has his own idea of what this constitution should be like. You mentioned Britain. Britain is a different, uh, you know, it's a parliamentary system. Their constitution is written. You mentioned the United States. They've been at it for 200 plus years. Let us give the constitution a chance. You know, uh, yes, uh, there are other issues that are confused with the constitution. Everything that goes wrong, if you have bad governance, if you had issues of corruption, ultimately everything goes on to why people point at the constitution as if simply by tweaking the constitution or by going ahead and saying, yes, let's uh, follow to a referendum and come with a full solution, all our solutions, all our problems it's, will have it's, solutions. It's, it's the magic one. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> all right. Okay. Benasara, yes, you... it is uh, uh, crucially essential uh, for us to posit the fact that uh, the current constitution we are having, right from the medieval days, right before the advent of Nigeria as a country up to now, is the most tested and the most legitimate document we are having as a constitution in the history of Nigeria. There has never been any constitution that has lasted for this period of years that we are seeing. 23 years of tested democracy under the constitution. And people easily forget. I remember very well in 1998 when there was these arrangements to hand over power to a democratically elected government. Uh, 
elected repre selected representatives and elected representatives were combined into the constituent assembly to deliberate and bring out this document and after the exercise this document was taken to state by state local government by local government professional bodies ethnic groups everybody was given the privilege to scrutinize it and at the end of it we finally said we agreed we have a constitution and section one of the constitution says that this constitution is supreme and its provisions are binding on all persons and authorities in the federal republic of nigeria so whether you like it or whether you don't like it it is binding on you so long you remain a citizen of the federal republic of nigeria and then when you say you want to practice democracy democracy like we said is a rule by the majority of the people and sovereignty belongs to the people as far as section 14 of section 1 and the same people now decided to elect their representatives that is the neatest and the most civilized way to handle state matters. You should have your own elected representatives. And these representatives are texted individuals, a highest degree of bureaucrats of uh, the best quality you can think of. There are former ministers, former governors, there are professors, there are intellectuals of diverse backgrounds in the, this uh, uh, legislature that we are having. These are the representatives of the people. The representatives of the people have constituency offices by virtue of which they they are filtering the opinions and aspirations of the citizenry and then they come and deliberate it at the gallery and at the end of it we now have the opinions of the people it is the galvanized opinion of the people that really gives the national assembly the impetus to say yes let us go ahead and amend these constitutions amendment of the constitution is always a reflection of the customs costumes culture and character of the citizenry of that particular society the citizens decided that we, we want these amendments there are so many amendments. For example, if we take the issue of the state police with the National Assembly, in the overall interest of the nation, decided to tinker it. You cannot in any way think of having state original police without alternative provisions of sections 153, K, L, and M and sections 214 to 219 of the constitution. These are the parameters under which you can be able to have anything that is called policing in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. The same thing, all these ethno, regional, tribal, paramodial cleavages that we are seeing imagined here in, in, in the polity, you cannot change it if you are not a representative of the people. That is the beauty of democracy. So whosoever is not satisfied uh, should go and aspire and become a member or whether the national or state or even the local government assembly. As a result of which you will have the basis to really beat your chest and say, yes, I am a bona fide representative of the people on the basis of which you can speak for the people. So, so long we are now, we, we decide we want to practice democracy, then we must do it in tandem with the respect of the constitutional stipulations that we have in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And like I said, this is the most tested constitution and the most robust. And so long we are having it and it is experimental, like in my preamble I said, constitution is like the spirit of a life spirit of a life. The characters and the comportment of somebody at the age of seven will be different when he reaches the age of 20, will be different when he's the age of 40, 50, and the rest. So you cannot overnight expect us to reach the degree of perfection of United States or into the hundred of years they have been there practicing democracy. When you take the issue of Britain, for example, the Britain is completely different. It's an unwritten constitution and in Britain the queen is sovereign. The crown of the queen is sovereign. Here we said the supremacy of whatever we want to entrench in our system of governance is the people. In other words, the, the, the people have the determinants and then the people representatives here have spoken. So it is for us now to right. give our symbiotic support in tandem with sections 23 and 24 of the constitution we should now partake in giving on our support and right. uh, addition to the constitutional exercise the National Assembly and the State Assemblies are uh, undergoing. Okay, it's interesting you talk about uh, uh, sovereignty of the crowd and that's one area we'll go to shortly but we have a number of reports. Let's uh, start off with the very first one uh, from Lagos. We the people of the Federal Republic of Nigeria having firmly and solemnly resolved to live in unity and harmony as one indivisible and indissoluble nation under God. This signifies the strength of the Nigerian constitution, the legal document that makes the country a sovereign nation as well as contains the supreme laws of the land. 
The document is on the verge of experiencing some changes with the ongoing amendment of some sections to meet up with the present realities in various sectors. So far, some bills which bother on financial independence for state houses of assembly and the judiciary have gained favor from the lawmakers, and this is generating commendations from the populace. Uh, the amendment is also proposing that uh, states can actually generate uh, power and actually transmit that. So you can see that uh, it's trying to decongest uh, the exclusive legislative list uh, so that uh, the state government will be able to go into certain uh, sectors for the purpose of development of the state level. And of course, we have also seen a attempt to uh, strengthen democracy at the grassroots level. Out of the items on the decision table, some are not lucky to survive deliberations, even with strong clamor from various groups. I recall that the National Assembly had to have a retreat where they harmonized those items that they would vote on. And for them to have considered those five gender bills and proposed them for voting, I believe that they must trust their colleagues who work on those bills to say that we need, even if we are not going to give women all that they needed, uh, I mean, passing all the five, there are, I have issues uh, with one or two of them. Um, particularly, particularly, I have issues with the one that tends to say we should create a special seat for women. Um, I feel that that bill should have been reworked to make the affirmative action to be from the existing number of the House of Reps and Senate and State House of Assembly that we had. Though the 1999 Constitution is presently under review for the fifth alteration, some groups believe the country needs a new constitution to address evolving matters. The country has so advanced way ahead of the constitution. There are so many issues that have come up is confronting us right now as a people that the constitution cannot answer, that the constitution lack answers to. This is why the constitution must be overhauled. As the process continues, experts are hopeful all right, that uh, report from Lagos, even as it was on, uh, it was also generating comments. And uh, let's now see the one that's uh, coming next from Kaduna. Constitutional amendment is part of legislative prerogative, and the National Assembly has been making attempts to correct the imperfection of the nation's constitution, which was a product of military. This is the second attempt by the Ninth Assembly to amend the constitution to make it in tune with current political realities on ground. Legal luminaries in Kaduna have described the move as an apt development. They are very fast about it. Mm, but, and I think this will also heed the advice of of Nigerians now who want many things altered. For example, devolution of powers, most importantly. For us, we see the constitutional uh, amendment as a, a one-sided issue that favors the men because when you look at their numbers at the National Assembly, they are in the majority. In short, I would like to say they are in short, it's almost uh, everything is about them. Most written constitutions are rigid when it comes to amendment. So when you are amending such uh, uh, constitutions, what you try to do is to start an early activity of amendment when the National Assembly is elected. But you can see that uh, time is even running out. Although they are passionate about it, but we cannot say that they may not be able to conclude it. Expunging contentious issues and amending clauses inconsistent with nation's democratic system are part what occupy the constitutional amendment process. These are areas that are already captured in the constitution, but it is a constitution that has been practiced in the last 22 years. But those basic aspects of the constitution have not been implemented. Issues of local government autonomy will be realistic if the National Assembly abrogate state and local government joint accounts as well as abolishing of state independent electoral commissions in Kaduna, Dauda Mohammed. All right, I, I did say we'll talk about uh, the question of um, 
uh, uh, the place of the traditional institution in Nigeria. But before we go into that, the, the matter of uh, local government, the autonomy, uh, the financial autonomy, and also that of the judiciary is, is one that has reverberated over the years. So let's go to Honorable Abubakar Sadiq Jallu and say, now this is coming to pass. What can Nigerians look forward to? Well, you can speak about your state, but um, this is also going to go through other states. And what is the thinking here that lessons from the past have been learned and we might well see um, what, without even taking uh, uh, <laughs> any kind of statistical census, what we believe many Nigerians would be in favor of? Uh, Mr. Cyril, I think uh, uh, I would not like to preempt uh, what will come out of the uh, uh, maybe rigorous uh, legislative procedure. Uh, but I would like to say here that uh, we will subject the bill uh, to the normal process of legislative process that is will subject you to, uh, let's say, public hearing. And we will hear the animal of our people, and that is what we, we will support. And, I believe we will do that without uh, any interference from any quarter. So whatever I will say here is my opinion. And because we are yet to receive uh, the proposal for the amendment and we are yet to subject it uh, to the public hearing. So whatever I will say here is not the opinion of my people. I think it's, uh, it will be my personal opinion. So I think I will wait till when the bill is uh, with us and we will subject it to the public hearing and we will do uh, what is needful and what we will support is what is the end of our people or what our people want. Let me just put this to you. This other aspect is what might be considered a very general uh, uh, matter of interest. Um, it cuts across and that is uh, securing a constitutional position for the traditional institution. We're fond of saying, oh, the, the, the traditional institution, the, the, they are the custodians of, of, of the people's culture, but we have not yet assigned any proper rule. So what would you say about this time around that the thinking is they should have a proper role? Yeah, and I think I'm in support of that because when we look at our history, when we look at uh, the pre-colonial era, we see that uh, the traditional rulers played a very vital role uh, in the administrative, uh, in the administration of uh, both justice and, uh, uh, and we, uh, for example, in northern Nigeria, we had a very uh, sound uh, system, uh, but. That's, let's, uh, in the uh, judiciary and the legislatures where the MES uh, sit in courts and decide cases. And they also play vital roles. And when we look at, most especially in terms of security, we can say that uh, we are far better then than what we have now because these traditional institutions, uh, the traditional rulers are very close because these traditional institutions are... Traditional. The traditional uh, leaders are very close to the people. And once we give them the authority or the power to participate, I believe they have a very good role to play and they will have a say. For example, uh, I, 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 there was a bill I was, uh, sponsor, I, I was about to sponsor that will empower all these uh, district heads and what heads power to register all uh, tenants or people that are staying in their area. So I think uh, this will go a very long way and I, I support this and it will really help in maybe uh, uh, ensuring that we have a very good security system in the country. Uh, let, let's now go over to Dr. Uh, Abdul Fatai Sambu uh, in Lori and uh, the issues now, local governments, the autonomy, and these are still very contentious issues. As I said earlier on, given past experiences, and this process will go through the state assemblies again. What can we expect? Well, just 
what I talked about the other time. Uh, before going to that, I actually did not uh, say the condition is not supreme. Of course, section one, sub one is there. Its provisions have binding force on all authorities and persons throughout the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And that uh, the, the thing now is, local government, I even cited the example of US Constitution and British. And the reason for citing it is that if you look at uh, US Australian Constitution that came into being uh, as long as uh, 1778, and you have you look at the whole document of the US Constitution, it's not up to 30 pages. Now, look at the UK Constitution is essentially on the thing. The point, the point I'm trying to make is good governance uh, does not actually mean that we have an extremely bulky constitution. Before you cannot say, yes, we'll hear this, we need to go have a good governance. But the point I'm trying to make is issue of uh, local government autonomy, states are likely to reject it. They're likely to reject it because the true federalism that most states' governors will argue uh, shows that. Uh, uh, local government is essentially within the ambit of the states. And if you look at the case of Attorney General of Lagos State and Attorney General of the Federation, that case has confidently brought the Lagos, uh, I, mean, I mean, the local government within the ambit of the state governors. And to this extent that these bills are still coming back to these governors, they, they, there's, a, there's a tendency that uh, the government may also kill that particular bill so that it's not even scale through. Now, the point now is that if it's, a, if it's a situation where people themselves, people themselves decide what we should have in the constitution, then nobody will constitute any toolkit to the experts without having a very uh, homegrown or totalist uh, constitution. But as long as we subject ourselves to some of this uh, opportunity, then it will, have, it will lead to a situation where uh, we will continue to grow. Look at the very beautiful point that you made the other time, the role of traditional rulers. The role of traditional rulers is, I mean, you don't see it clearly in the constitution, it's not even there in the constitution. Meanwhile, we have nice constitutions all over the world. Look at the, uh, the federal constitution of Malaysia, where you have uh, uh, traditional rulers, long departure, and going being given wide roles to play in this particular. But in a situation where some stakeholders, mind you, the, if you look at section four of the constitution, it gives the National Assembly the power to make law for the peace, order, and growth government of Nigeria according to the constitution. That is according to, they give them a particular document. Go ahead with this document and make law for the purpose of uh, peace, order, and growth government of the, of, of the federation. And when they make these laws, it doesn't extend to the power to actually give us a new constitution because we were, they were elected for the purpose of lawmaking not for the purpose of actually making a new constitution. And of course, they have actually known their boundaries, and that is why you see that uh, they are actually altering. And when you keep altering a document for almost uh, 23 years now, you know, it's uh, having the car, you keep patching, patching, patching. It will get to an extent that uh, the car will be, be, be so difficult to even to even try. So the point I'm making is that I'm not saying the institutions at the moment are not legitimate. Of course, people voted for them. They are, uh, they are legitimate institutions. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make is that to give this thing more legitimacy, and uh, you do expect the National Assembly with due respect to actually alter the provision of the Constitution to, be, to their disadvantage. It's not just possible. You don't expect a situation where the members of the National Assembly will alter the Constitution to say, okay, we don't need the Senate, or we don't need the House of Reps again. It will never happen. You can't see a situation, so there are some fundamentals that alteration of the Constitution will never solve except you have people deciding their fate by themselves. And when people decide, then people will even respect the constitution. Well, sorry, Dr. Abdul Fattah, if I might just cut it here. Um, you would not be suggesting by uh, any scope of the imagination that um, uh, the members of the National Assembly who were engaged in uh, amending or altering the constitution, as you prefer to call it, um, might do what is only beneficial to them. You'd not be saying that, would you? Well, okay, sorry, that, that, that's the point, actually, because uh, that's the truth, because you don't expect uh, the question to be amended, but to be altered in such a way as to affect uh, the, the, the interests of the members of the National Assembly. It will, it will not happen. But if the people themselves say this is what, and another thing is people will know the content of the question because it will pass through popular processes. And 
uh, it will not, it will not be as if something is done in the, well, I understand that from, from the American, I mean, from the operation so far, this particular amendment actually went around the country and people actually uh, participated. And of course, I even had a memorandum that actually wrote for this particular, I mean, purpose of uh, alteration. But the point I've done is there are some fundamentals. For instance, now look at the presumption of innocence in the constitution. Other Nigerians will believe that if an accused person is caught red-handed, he should just, yeah, you, you see somebody uh, stealing or uh, uh, kill somebody red-handedly, then and uh, you that person is subjected to trial that lasts almost 10 years. Ordinarily, the way we, we the way we, uh, our traditional system of justice will be, will be that, okay, somebody has committed an offense, it's so clear that person has made a confession, the confession is clear, okay, why does the person have to stay for so long before that person is actually punished? But the thing is, that's the problem of the question. The question says they are presumed innocent. And we have in so many other countries, like from proposed speaking countries, where their concern is saying presumption of guilt. There are some offenses that should also that should actually carry the presumption of guilt that's uh, apart from the uh, presumption of innocence. And that is why when you put these fundamentals to those who are actually uh, experts in that uh, particular process. Okay, well, well, well we, 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 more, more, more fundamental issues being thrown up here, but we'll return to one. I, I just want to quickly um, go to Senator Ibrahim Adeja on one of the things you just mentioned. Uh, if I recall correctly, you threw out the, you know, uh, the matter of uh, a life pension for presiding officers. I would have thought that was in the interest of them. So if, if you're only going to consider things in your interest, why did you throw that out? I know, not only was it thrown out, it was the, the, the bill that was thrown out with the largest margin uh, <laughs> when we voted. We also threw out the issue of uh, immunity, you know, for, for legislators because uh, it was actually, I think, a bill that... Uh, wanted to extend the same uh, immunity on the executives to legislators. And it was thrown out based on the fact that, uh, you know, everyone uh, could see that uh, it wasn't very popular out there. People forget that we're answerable to the people that elected us. And if you go there and uh, uh, start towing the line of uh, somebody else, you go and face your electorate uh, back home. Like I said, there was a very, very robust... Uh, uh, public hearing, you know, far-reaching. I was in Kaduna, I was here in uh, uh, in Abuja, you know. It was open to all. I mean, was, was say, we, we, we had a limit of maybe 30 uh, presentations per day. Sometimes we ended up taking 57, 60, you know. We ended up uh, leaving at 7.30 because we didn't want a situation where somebody would, would say he came with uh, his own uh, mm. presentation and he was excluded. So we took all manner of, uh, uh, you know, public opinion. And uh, that was what formed, uh, you know, later on when we sat down and uh, uh, harmonized between ourselves and the uh, House of Representatives. We also sat down and harmonized between us and the speakers of the uh, House of Assembly. A lot of the considerations were actually drawn from what we got from those public hearings. It's not about me, you know. It's not about uh, uh, the Senate uh, only sitting down to... Uh, uh, deliberate on what would uh, favor them. Like I said, uh, the, those things that, uh, those two bills that favored the Senate were thrown out with the highest margin without any, without blinking an eye. So I don't think it's, uh, it's correct. Uh, the people, people really, really underestimate what they see about National Assembly is the public, uh, you know, you stand up in the red or green chamber and talk. A lot of what happens, you know, a lot of the constituency outreach, a lot of, and we have gotten to a point now, people forget that also going to a point where our electoral process has really been cleaned up. Votes are counting. And we all know that votes are counting. So I'm not answerable to uh, myself. I'm not answerable to an instruction from somebody. You're answerable to people that elected you. And if you dare go and uh, support anything that, uh, you know, goes against their thinking, uh, after the, uh, the, 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 the review process, I remember I participated in a radio program in Jigawa in Dusi. And surprisingly, <laughs> by the time I finish explaining, uh, you know, especially the autonomy, the autonomy for lo local government, the implications and so on and so forth. Of the six or seven, it was a live phone in process, right. or seven calls we got, 
people were shouting, why did we go and support uh, local government autonomy? Because contrary to the belief, I can give you an example of a state like Jiga where I, where, where, where I represent, not all, it's not all about a governor amassing uh, local government funds and spending it anywhere he wants. There are local, some local governments that can barely meet their salary obligations. And I remember as a deputy governor from 2015 to, uh, to 2018, 2016 when the economy took a nosedive, for almost a year and a half we were dipping hands into state government money to support local governments who had a deficit because the money was not enough. So I said, fine, you, you know, local government, uh, financial autonomy, my governor would be the first to say, please let them go. Because for him, it has become less of a burden. But what that means is that every local government has to answer his father's name. Uh, you know, if you are getting uh, only 20 or 30 million based on your uh, allocation, you are going to have to find out how to fill the gap of 60 or 70 million, to, first of all, to pay salaries and then to come and face uh, people and tell them why refuse has not been uh, served from the streets, why you haven't paid uh, local government workers, because, uh, you know, you cannot cope. It's not every local government that gets the money that HOSA or OBACO is getting. So that's the local that's what, and that's what I want to talk about the fact that we're all answerable to our electorate. I have a peculiar set of issues. I have a peculiar set of problems. I have a peculiar set of demands. My demands are different from uh, what obtains in uh, in Lauren in Kwara State, for example. So I I I, I really don't think uh, you know. Uh, professor, he's probably been in the classroom too long. Some of times, I, 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 when people talk about politics, they talk about it from what they read in the pages of newspapers. And uh, I know that uh, uh, the National Assembly, in particular, has been in the spotlight for some time. So you know, we are used to this bashing, but it's not what what it seems. Mm -hmm. All right, Minister. Yes. Yes. Uh, if you look at. Uh... The legislations the National Assembly are proposing, in other words, the amendments they are proposing, there are some amendments they propose that are really dispositions of statesmanship. For example, the issue of giving time limitation within which the president should appoint or should present the list of his ministers to the National Assembly. It's very, very fundamental. We saw how many number of months were wasted at the advent of uh, President Buhari's uh, coming in. Uh, we saw that one, the, 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 the loss uh, for the nation is really regrettable. And the National Assembly, as the pulse of the nation, decided to put a stop to that. That is what. Secondly, the National Assembly decided to put the interests of the common people at heart uh, when they bring about the compulsory free education at basic level. Uh, that is in tandem with section 18 of the constitution that talks about the educational objectives of uh, Nigeria. The, edu the Nigeria's objective regarding education, the egalitarian nature. So this is a very important milestone when you talk about the decision. Then another thing the National Assembly did that should be commended is the throwing away of the issue of state policy. By the time you allow state policing to continue. Uh, it is paradoxical for some people to just come up and say we have created uh, so 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 regional state police when they know that the regional state police in absence of any legislative machinery to appropriate any money for the uh, regional state policing, it cannot even function. And there is no provision of regional decision. There is nowhere in the constitution that you have any regional uh, structure. We don't have that provision as far as sections two and three of the constitution is federal, state, and local government. There is nothing like regional. Then another... Yes, yes on, on this matter of, the, of state police, yes. and, um, uh, some would argue, say, in the, in the midst of the insecurity that we were facing in the country now, would it not have been a good idea to consider having the state police? No, 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 no. The panacea to the problem of insecurity is for us to consider the security architecture of the country. Uh, the security architecture of the country, if you take, for example, advanced countries, you will discover that they have been about, uh, uh, let's say, 40 to 70 components of security architecture. In Nigeria, we have to look at our policing system, not on the basis of 1904 police structure. We have to look at it at the emerging realities. For example, we need border patrol policy. We need cyber crimes policy. We need anti-terrorism policy. We need all sorts of components of policy that are in tandem with the evolutionary type of 
policy security problems that we're having. And then you have to amend sections 153K that is talking about the Nigerian Defense Council. L that is talking about the National Security Council. M that is talking about the Nigerian Police Council. And even if you are to do that one, you have to amend sections 214 to 216 that says that exclusively it is the police that has the responsibility of maintaining of internal security. And where the police cannot handle that one, then you now invoke the provisions of sections 217 to 219 by inviting other components of the security to come and assist. Now, in that context, you have to evaluate the capacity of the police we have vis-a-vis -vis the population. 385,000 police that we have in, half of them are there, uh, you know, safeguarding the interests and the lives of uh, Mr. Somebody's. Half of it there is there protecting multinational corporations, sensitive governmental establishments, serving as convoys to VIPs and the rest. The are men in half or very little of it will be the ones that are navigating roads and the distance and then you have very... So we should increase the number of the police. We should make all companies of our developmental structure under the police if we really want to be serious. For example, the immigration, the customs, the civil defense code, all these are supposed to be under the police. But because we place interest of money, revenue generation, we said customs should not be under finance, not under money. So we need to evaluate and restructure the security architecture as a whole. The National Defense Council, the National Police Council, the Nigerian Security Council should be the ones that will meet. And all the governors are members of the National Security okay. Council. So that at the end of it, they bring an evolution of your police proposal that will put an end to the inadequacies of the police mechanism that we're having in the country to contain the emerging security challenges that we're having. All right, we'll take a short break here. When we return, uh, the phone lines will be open. That means you can get to join the discussion in the studio and we will explore further the process of amending, altering the Constitution. Stay with us. We'll be back. What if you stumble stumble into an opportunity at your own convenience? What if you stumble? Stumble into a friendly stranger and all you had to do is wave. What if? What if you unlock the opportunity of a lifetime with this new acquaintance in a branded shirt? What if all you have to do is your favorite things in your favorite places? Shopping at the mall, having a weekend getaway, or going to the movies. Your future is right outside your door. We are closer than you think. busy ancient city of Onija is a commercial hub with millions of commuters seamlessly linking other states daily for business, leisure, and other purposes. To upscale its road network, the construction of a 1.6 kilometer long second Niger bridge, including a 10.3 kilometer highway furnished with other infrastructure, has been in motion by the federal government. This project will ease congestion on the existing 56 year old Onitra Bridge and boost the economic capacity of the state as it easily connects to other parts of the country. The completion of the world class second Niger Bridge Onitra will be one of the many proud moments of the state, its people, Nigeria and foreign investors. Onicha, which hosts the largest market in Africa, is geared up to boast of an impressive road network. Once again, these moments are made alive by the federal government and it is deserving of all the applause. <laughs> NTA Tuesday Live, a network issue oriented innovation talk show. Thanks for staying with us. Um, well, this segment, of course. Uh, the phone lines will be open, it means you can get to join in the discussion in the studio and we promise we would acquaint you with the procedure. It's something we say every Tuesday. If you do call in 
and your call gets through to the studio, turn down the volume of your TV set. That's the way to avoid the hurlback or the echo. And we also encourage you to go straight to the point, ask your question or make a comment. Do not bother too much about the greetings. A simple hello is fine. There's not much time for you to stay on. Don't bother about all the other things that go with greetings. Just go straight to the point, ask a question or raise an issue. And our guests here will address whatever issues you might raise. So we start off now with another of our reports, this time from Inugu. Nigeria has witnessed several constitutions from inception. The constitution is the supreme law of the land, which individuals and all facets of parliament must not contravene. This fundamental apparatus of a nation's law guarantees the citizenry's several rights and liberties. What is known today as Nigeria is made up of various ethnic groups, with social political institutions merged into an administrative unit. Research shows that the establishment of Nigeria laid the foundation for constitutional development in the country. Experts in Enugu described the recent move by President Muhammadu Buhari in signing the Electoral Amendment Act into law as a right step to constitutional development, which will be of immense benefit to Nigerian populace. Yes, it is a good development, but then the stakeholders, the state actors involved in implementing that law should also try and abide by the provisions of the law. On the legislative actions on further bills seeking amendments of the constitution, a constitutional lawyer in Enugu says the legal process of any change must be guaranteed by the stipulated law. When Mr. President or a state governor vetoes any bill, that bill will be passed when it is returned to the legislature by a simple majority. But today it's not possible. You can only veto that assent by two-third majority. It is wrong for anybody to question constitutional amendment. It can be, it, even if it's um, one million times needed, it should be done. There's a, a principle of law that said that reason is the soul of the law. And the moment the reason changes, then the law is essentially changed. So if the reason for any particular provision of the constitution changes, then there is the need to change that part of the constitution. While Nigerians are expected to abide by the laws from this constitutional development, they are optimistic that those in authority should consider the plight of the masses when amending any chapter of the constitution. All right, we have a call coming through now from Port Harcourt, Safon, I believe. Hello. Hello, I can hear you. Hello? Hello, go ahead. Okay. In fact, I want to congratulate the last speaker that uh, my brother from Jigawa uh, and the other person that talk about the competition. In fact, it's very important to us to see that to take care of our, our people that we are seeing something happen in this country. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh -huh. Because this country needs something to good for us, and let us take care of our, our people that are thinking about good for us. Okay. Yeah. So that's your thank comment. You. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's uh, go over to our Kanu Network Center. And uh, again, the question of uh, autonomy, judicial autonomy. We've asked this question so many times. Why would it be that uh, executives are not too willing to grant this autonomy? And uh, you find it also happens that there are lawyers among uh, uh, governors who would not want to grant autonomy. Uh, why is that so, do you think? So, Mr. Cyril, I, I can't actually say why, because I'm not part of the executive, so I might not know their reasons for doing that. And uh, But I think uh, this time around, uh, I doubt much if there will be uh, too much opposition from the executive as far as the 
uh, autonomy of the judiciary is concerned. Because uh, going by uh, what we are seeing day by day, we can say to some extent that the judiciary is uh, already independent because you will be seeing judgments that are against the executive arm of government uh, coming out from our courts day by day. Despite uh, maybe the fact that uh, there is no financial autonomy for the judiciary. So I can say uh, giving them the autonomy will not uh, uh, will be a good thing and it will help our democracy. It will help our democracy grow and it will be good for, uh, for the country. And I believe this time around most of the executives will uh, give their support. Uh, let's go back to the phones now. We have uh, uh, Omar Anache calling in from Brindin Kebi. Hello, go ahead. Hello, thank you, Siro. My name is Omar Anache calling from Brindin Kebi. Let me appreciate my elder brother, Minister Kuku. May God bless us with some people like him. And uh, secondly, let me recommend the state, no, the National Assembly for the job well done. Particularly, the amendment that ties me is the, the one that limits, give, give, give limits to the president and the governor's time limit. They state their time limit within which they will they would appoint their, their, their commissioner and their ministers as well. And uh, secondly, or thirdly, it is not the amendment of the Constitution that matters, but following the Constitution. Several times we will amend the Constitution, but if we do not follow it, we will not achieve what we want to achieve. That is, law and order must be guided by the Constitution and must be followed religiously. What, what, what is the problem of Nigeria is the law and order. If, if the Constitution is amended millions million times, if it is not followed, the aim is not being achieved. That is what I'm going to say. May God continue to bless our country. All Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Well, back here in the studio, we uh, were talking on the issue of uh, autonomy for the judiciary and um, why it would seem that um, there's some foot dragging over that. Mm. <laughs> yes. Uh, the judiciary, because of the ethics of the profession, uh, definitely is bound uh, to be receiving negligent attention, let me use that terminology, uh, because they are not known really to be blowing their own trumpets. And they are not known really to be agitating for themselves, because they are the arbiter of filtering the society's interest. And uh, they have been doing the best within the ambits of their limitations. But uh, it is very difficult for an average executive member to really think of absolute autonomy for the judiciary. Uh, because when you look at the character of an average politician, a politician in most cases uh, with the highest respect to the practitioners, uh, a politician is not necessarily to be a statesman. Uh, it requires somebody to be a statesman for him to jettison his own interest, for him, for him to jettison his own paramodial considerations and uh, give overall better interest of the nation over and above what he wants. In most cases, uh, when you look at the way politicians are playing their game, uh, it is more or less a matter of uh, self-actualization, self-protection, and self-advancement uh, in most cases. And that is the reason why you see a gap between the citizenry expectation of development from the politicians, which in most cases, every society you see development, it emanates from the statesmen and not necessarily the politicians. So, so long we don't match what uh, Umar Anate talk about, the practice of the amendments. There may be amendments, excellent, very good amendments, <laughs> but if they don't get complementary practice of okay. the genuine intentment, putting the nation over and above any other consideration, then we will continue to be making amendments 
without practical realization of the ultimate and the expectations. All right, back to the phones now. We have Victor calling in from Lagos. Hello, Victor, go ahead. Hello, good evening. Good evening. I think it has been a very robust uh, discussion. I have a question for the distinguished in the house. But before that, I just want to say, I think uh, I think your guest in the house is construed from earlier when we talked about the homegrown uh, constitution uh, or the condition of being homegrown. Well, maybe they will have to take state courses for prop to enlighten them on that. And uh, that said, you know, in developed clients that we like to pop, I would like to mention, researchers conduct research, write papers, and make recommendations. Government adopts those recommendations as policies. Here in our clients, if a professor or a researcher is speaking or is speaking from those conducted research, most times self sponsored, is being referred to as someone who are really speaking from, you know, having spent too much time in the classroom, you know, as said by the distinguished. I'm going to leave that at that. But I want to ask a question. Honorable Senator, sir, what's your, the next phases of amendment that we're going to see? I, I will put into consideration what is happening now in. Uh, in uh, Ebony State, do you think do you think defection from uh, uh, by politicians from one party to the other? Do you think that is a matter that should come up? You know, at this time, you know, in part of our constitutional amendment, you know, I, I want to I want to know if if if, if that is being considered, if it's on the table, or if it's something you see shouldn't be shouldn't be part of our constitutional amendment. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Victor. The Senator, how do you? If memory serves me. Right. I think uh, one of the bills thrown out uh, actually, uh, you, you, you know, was about uh, losing your seat uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you switch uh, parties. And, uh, you know, having said that, uh, we, we, we're looking at the Ebonyi situation in isolation. These things have happened. People have been switching <laughs> parties since 1999 both at the uh, legislative and at the uh, executive level. Mm. And it has gone to court, all the way to the Supreme Court, you know, and the Supreme Court has affirmed that uh, uh, simply because you switch parties, the Constitution gives a proviso in the sense that if you can prove that uh, uh, there's a divide in the party, then of course you can uh, uh, easily uh, uh, switch parties without uh, any implication. Even having said that, you know, we've seen situations where uh, in some states, the division is actually created, you know, so that uh, one can justify uh, moving from one party to another. But uh, I think uh, it was uh, one of the bills that was uh, presented, and it wasn't very popular, perhaps, because even within the National Assembly, uh, there's quite uh, a lot of uh, uh, movement from both parties, I may say, you know, from one party to the other, from the opposition party to the uh, ruling party. All right. Mm. Yeah. Yes, I want to interject a little because Section 58 that talks about this issue of uh, where somebody defects to another party, except if it's as a result of the division, is so micro, it's restricted only to parliamentarians. I think it is very, very important the National Assembly should consider widening the rock to cover <laughs> any elected officer so that so as to sanitize the system. In a situation whereby you get all these gladiatory movements from one party to the other without ideological uh, sense of uh, uh, respect or anything, virtually now you cannot say what is the difference between APC and PDP, for example, if not the name. Those that were there as the founding fathers of this will be among those that are aspiring to become chairman of this party. So it is important to have some sense of sanity and and this device will be one of those things that will sanitize. Let it not be restricted to legislature. Let us go to all appointees and all elected officers of Nigeria. Whosoever leaves the vehicle that brings him to office should abandon the office and move into another vehicle accordingly. Okay. Um, back to the phones. We have Brian calling in from uh, Lagos. Brian from Lagos, go ahead. Yes. Good afternoon. Good evening, Mr. Sirio. Good evening. And distinguished senators and guests on the show, I really appreciate. I would like to say one of the issues of the constitutional amendment we are having in this country, uh, one of the main issues why we seem not to be getting it right is because, like one of the guests rightly said, 
we lack a political ideology in this country between APC, PDP, AD, and all of them. There is really a lack of uh, political ideology. I believe the aim of a constitutional amendment should be to amend the constitution along the path of a political ideology. But when there is no defined political ideology, what we find out is we amend the constitution to the left, to the right, to, to the um, center, left, up, down, but there's no real clear direction as to the progress of the country. And I believe our political leaders uh, need to do more in terms of political ideology. And I think that would also help to curtail this uh, uh, cross carpeting between political parties, because then people would know, okay, you stand for a political ideology whereby you want people to have certain rights or certain uh, principles. So it's going to be difficult to create uh, cross carpet like they like they say. So that's just my permission. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I really appreciate. It. Well, thank you very much, Brian from Lagos. Thank you. Well, let's go over to um, Ilori and uh, uh, put this matter of um, some of the uh, uh, amendments we're talking about here. For instance, uh, uh, the autonomy of the judiciary. Why has this taken such a long time to, to, to come about? Thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, over the years, it's been only difficult to actually say, okay, judiciary, let us give you the autonomy. And like it was rightly pointed out, the, it's partly because uh, judiciary is the members of the judiciary don't blow their trumpets. And of course, uh, based on that, they are usually taken for granted, and that is why you see uh, them not having financial autonomy. I did a study sometimes in 2011, in which I had to interview uh, a number of uh, judges and justices across the country, up to the Supreme Court, as to whether they actually want uh, what we call uh, uh, financial autonomy. Because in the past, the traditional understanding of judges was that uh, they, do, they usually do not want to hold money. Because when they hold money, that could be something like judicial scandal. So that the clerk of the court may write the petition. Imagine the head of court going to EFCC or ITPC for questioning. And based on that particular reason, that was the traditional reason why judges themselves did not actually want uh, financial independence. <laughs> but uh, circumstances and a lot of intrigues have shown that uh, their position uh, I mean, was actually, is actually uh, open ended. And now there's a need for rider. And that's the reason why many judges are now saying, yes, yeah, they want to hold their money because they've been so much deprived of these funds. And uh, to that extent, they themselves are now desirous of having uh, what we call uh, financial autonomy. And at this stage now, uh, executives don't actually want to release it because once judges are truly independent, in the true sense of the word independence, then uh, they won't be able to uh, control them. And of course, you know, generally who pays the, I would uh, pays the piper, the pays the truth. And to that extent, uh, politicians or perhaps executives will not want a situation where judges will be totally uh, independent so that at least they will have some level of control over some of these, uh, some of these judicial uh, officers. But I think uh, if we can be so dispassionate, uh, if we are so, Rhetoric enough about this particular nation. We, it's better because we can't be in, in the particular office forever. It would, it would be better. It would be better for us to have a situation where judges will be able to give their decisions without any fear or favor, affection, or evil. All right. Thank you. Back to the phone lines. We have Mohammed calling in from Jigawa. Hello. 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 Good morning. Yes. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'm Mohammed calling from Jigawa State. Ziko, how are you? I want to thank my distinguished senator for being speaking on behalf of us. And uh, I also wanted to thank the honorable member representing Hadeja constituency for all of us speaking on behalf of us. I know all this issue is about uh, judiciary autonomy. The big problem we had is not from our legislators, it's about our governors. When 
the autonomy the governors are not safe enough when they allow the autonomy to pass through so we are very happy for them to stand and help to contribute issue of autonomy okay because its autonomy is part of democracy so we want them to push harder for the autonomy to be granted thank you very much All right. thank you very much thank, thank you. you very much right thank you very much well back here in the studio senator one of the most discussed uh, matters arising from this effort to amend the constitution has to do with women issues yeah. The House of Representatives has decided to go back and uh, look at uh, three of those bills that were thrown out. And uh, you could see at the time those bills suffered at the National Assembly, Nigerian women were furious that um, how come the legislature is not taking women issues seriously? I don't think the legislature is not uh, taking women's issues seriously. You see, these bills, uh, you know, lawmaking is an, it's an issue of advocacy. So I told you, we went for the public hearings, we got people's opinion. And on the day those uh, uh, bills were passed, various uh, legislators with interest in some of those bills went around their colleagues to try and lobby them on voting uh, one way or the other. Unfortunately, we have very few women in the Senate. Uh, a little more in the House of Representatives. And I also fault the way some of the bills were articulated. Uh, for example, uh, uh, sure, you have to, you, 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 if I was an advocate of a smaller legislature, like somebody was mentioning, people have the opinion that uh, maybe we don't need uh, bicameral legislature, maybe we need a smaller uh, National Assembly, and then here we are, uh, you're asking me to support the addition of uh, an additional seat for women, making uh, four senators and uh, maybe uh, God knows how many uh, members of the House of Reps increasing the number, uh, so to speak. Uh, so, you know, it could have been articulated uh, uh, much better. My surprise was the one on uh, citizenship. I really don't understand what happened in that case. But of these two and the other one that mentioned uh, a specific number of appointees, for example, in the cabinet, uh, that also was not, uh, I didn't go down well with a lot of people because I think it was mentioning a specific figure, say a minimum of 10. Uh, uh, women. If I be, be, if you go to a state like Bielsa, where there are only eight local governments, and the governor decides uh, to uh, you know uh, appoint and uh, achieve uh, a spread, uh, he has to appoint uh, ten women. So even if he adds two additional commissioners, that means all his commissioners are women. Having said that, women constitute a potent uh, electoral force in this country. Uh, I've spoken to some of my colleagues. What you see happen on election day is that the massive turnout uh, is often by the women folk. Uh, and again, they are more resilient. Sometimes up to 6, 6.30 p.m., if you go to the voting queue, the only people left behind are women. So I don't understand why, for example, uh, we can't take it back to the grassroots uh, uh, and maybe also look at the parties. In a lot of countries, what happens is that the affirmative action is taken at the party level. It's not enough to say women are not supposed to buy forms. No, uh, the party should uh, uh, be encouraged to say, for example, uh, yeah, we have three senators uh, coming from each state. One of them must go to a woman at the party level. You don't need a constitutional amendment to do that. You know, uh, and in, in fact, some countries uh, encourage that. Go to Spain, go to Mexico. Uh, you know, in Ireland, if you have a minimum number of women on the poll, you get certain government funding and so on and so forth. Even in France. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have seen how successful that has been uh, in terms of having women fall. Women actually do a lot better uh, when it comes to uh, uh, governance. We've seen that uh, even in National Assembly, the full women that we have uh, are Amazons in their own right. And uh, the more women we have, I think the better for us. But I think taking it to the constitutional level uh, creates its own issues. Just like we were discussing earlier on, in the constitution there, is, uh, there are sections that, uh, you know, uh, talk about discrimination based on sex. If you now say, yes, yeah, this has to be a woman, somebody might go to court and say, oh, why am I being discriminated? Why can't you have uh, 
uh, you know, it's not that anybody is saying it has to be three male senators or it has to be 11 uh, male uh, House of Reps, but they went through a process and they got voted. So I think our focus should really be at the party level. Let's have a situation where parties are encouraged to be affirmative when it comes to women. Don't just give them free forms. Insist, insist that, uh, you know, for any set of electives, a certain number are reserved for women, uh, so that only women can be on that platform. And they are control, and then they can go and talk to the uh, woman folk, and then uh, we might, be, you know, see an, an improvement in the numbers uh, uh, going forward. I mean, sir, what do you think about this question of uh, women issues? <clears throat> yes, um, if there is justice, fair play, and equitable practice in the way we run the country, uh, probably all these acrimonies of uh, discriminations will be minimal. If you take the provisions of the Constitution, Section 14, Subsection 3, Section 15, Subsections 1, 2, and 3, Section 16, Section 17, 1, 2, 3, Sections 18, Section 19, Sections 21, 23, and 24 of the Constitution, all these provisions talks about social justice and equity. If you talk about social justice and equity, and if you tally it with the, uh, uh, the fact that our sovereignty rests with the people as far as section 14, subsection 1, then it is very, very important. You women should be listened to. But the approach to the women agitation normally is elitist-centered. That is where the problem arises. Like my brother, the distinguished senator, said, in tandem with section 223 that talks about the operational policies on the way you should go about in political. You must be involved for you to get what you want in politics. An average definition of politics in Nigeria is manipulation for self-interest, not entrenchment of robust development in the, in, in, in the interest of the larger citizenry. People go there to protect their own interests. So women should use their numerical power to enable them to vote as many women as possible. They have the capacity to have uh, 50, 40, 45 or 50 percent of the population so that they will have almost the same number of men and they are bound by the time they let me bring this to you. Yes. Although it might not even be restricted to women, but mm. you see, women also get the short end of the stick here. The question of indigent ship mm. that has affected so many women. Yes. Get, but is it isn't it strange, for instance, like some of them raised, that um, a man a woman is married to a Nigerian woman is married to a Nigerian man, and she cannot be considered you know, an indigent of his state, but a Nigerian man is um, is married to a non-Nigerian woman and he gets citizenship in that country. Yeah, re that re re and, re and if you move forward, why is it that there is a seeming conflict between citizenship and indigenship? Well, uh, those are some of the uh, inherent problems we're having. For example, like the case of distinguished Senator Binta Masigarba. Uh, the first time she was a distinguished senator from Kaduna State on account of marriage. And then <coughs> sub subsequently she emerged as a distinguished senator from her own home state, Adama State. Uh, definitely we need to revisit this and look at it in the interest of equity, fair play and justice. There is no reason why uh, you exploit the privilege of uh, by virtue of having uh, someone else uh, affinity and then you claim citizenship and then in the country here we don't entrench it. It is very very important where are the movement groups. The advocacy is really minimal and owing to lack of synergy and lack of coordination regarding unity of the women. For example, uh, so many of the women that will come and aspire, you'll discover that the fellow will be from the women folk. A very, a very good uh, uh, testimonial case of Sarah Jibril is still fresh in our mind uh, when she came out to contest and ended up with only her own votes, uh, including not even the votes of any other person that we are following now. You understand? So women should really think of having a nationally based platform not platform based on uh, uh, some uh, paramodial considerations of ethnic, ethnic belonging or professional okay. belonging let, or whatever. Let, let me put the same question to uh, Dr. Abdul Fattah Sambu. And, uh, hello? Hello? Yes. Uh, our. Please. My, okay, I'm we'll, we'll take this call and then name. we'll go to Dr. Abdul Fattah Sambu. Um, our from Berki, hello. If you're on the line, go ahead. Uh -huh. 
so but you have to turn here. down, I can hear the pearl back from your TV, so you have to turn down the volume of your TV. Okay. Right, go ahead. The question is uh, uh, coming to uh, 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 Dr. Menatra Umar. Uh, please, what are the, are the uh, constitutional rights for Nigerian police to be attached to all politicians while we are lacking police people in the, all various police stations in Nigeria? What Will, is judiciary trying to do about removing those police out of those politicians? We are all the same citizens. What are the people doing to return those people back to the decent for them to, to take care of insecurity in the country than attaching them to politicians? Why every citizen has the fundamental right to security and war whatsoever? Thank you very much. All right. Okay. So you just answer the question, and then we'll go to uh, <laughs> Dr. Abu Fatai. Subsection two of the Constitution says, "Security and welfare of the citizenry is the primary responsibility of government." And that particular question, to go straight to the point, is clearly illegal and is clearly in contradiction with the provisions of the Constitution, because Section fourteen, subsection three. Sections 15, section 16, sections 18, sections 21, 23, and 24 clearly says that there should not be any discrimination on ground of class, on ground of sex, on ground of age, on ground of tribal, on ground of religious, and on ground of any other paramodial consideration. So in a situation whereby the police, uh, uh, if you look at, like I said, the totality number of them, less than 400,000, is grossly inadequate with the 210 million Nigerians. And then half of these are deliberately kept for the sake of nepotism, for the sake of protecting those that are the officers of the state. That is clearly wrong. I think the police capacity should be increased, their number should be increased, their weaponry superiority over all the criminals we're having in the country should increase. But definitely, even if the number is increased and the sophistication is increased, there it is very, very important for our judicature system to be seriously uh, uh, panel beaten so that the service delivery will be seen. Every day you see committal of criminalities, but you will never see anybody being penalized. These kind of things are the, some of the factors uh, militating against the efforts of the police. The police should be increased very seriously, proportionate to the number of the citizens we are having, the superiority of the weaponry over the type of this thing. Then, like I said earlier on, it should be reorganized in such a way that we will have some specialized agencies of the police to handle emerging evolutionary threats that we're having in the country as a nation. So definitely speaking, to answer your question, it is illegal, it is wrong, it is in contravention with the provision of the Constitution, and it is self-centered and nepotistic <laughs> for police officers to be attached to Mr. VIPs in Nigeria. All right. Now, back to the question of uh, women issues, and then we go over to Dr. Abdul Fatai Sambu in Lori uh, to get his take on that. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, let me start by saying uh, I beg to disagree. There is nothing unconstitutional in uh, attaching policemen to politically exposed persons. Because if you look at Section 5 of the Constitution, what is actually important there as one of the executive for having powers is power to execute and maintain the Constitution. And power to execute and maintain the Constitution has been interpreted in the many concerns I mean, by the United States uh, Supreme Court in many cases. So it could uh, protection of the instrumentalities of government. And instrumentality of government will mean those who have been assigned with the duties of protecting, I mean, of uh, implementing the provision of the constitution. So to that extent, there is nothing unconstitutional, there is nothing illegal. As far as uh, what we should do is to employ more policemen so as to cater for every citizen of Nigeria, because at the moment, we don't have enough uh, policemen. Now, looking at the issue of uh, uh, women, uh, if you look at Section uh, 26 uh, of the Constitution, we are talking, we talk, it talks about a situation where uh, women, when, you get, when you marry, a woman gets married to a uh, foreign uh, husband, then uh, uh, it will not mean that uh, they have actually, I mean, they can be in the national, I mean, registered as a citizen uh, of Nigeria, I think uh, uh, that can also be extended to, I mean, so as to have this uh, gender balance. But 
uh, at any rate, it doesn't mean that uh, this thing cannot also be included in the constitution because if you don't include it in the constitution, you have uh, uh, sections 13 to 24 of the constitution have been cited. You discover that by virtue of the provision of section 6 of 6C of the constitution, the entire provisions of section uh, 13 to 24, that is chapter 2 of the constitution, has been rendered not justiciable. At least the, 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 power, the court has no power to enforce that particular provision, even though section 13 is saying, yes, it shall be the duties and responsibilities of every arm of government to enforce or ensure the observance of the provision of chapter 2. But that has been taken away by the provision of uh, section 6 of 6C of the Constitution, except the National Assembly at this time, now makes use of their power given on to them under part two, uh, item 60 seconds due to the 1999 Constitution, to now say that, yes, they want to activate the provision of this chapter two. Then that is where you see the issue of uh, political rights, economic rights, foreign policies of the being made uh, actually, actually just shape. And when you have, have women, women are actually also very, very important in, in, in our society. The, their roles cannot be just be taken away like that. But except it is uh, included in the constitution, the important thing of making this, uh, I mean, to be, to be, I mean, to constitutionalize this is that it will now lead to a situation where you can, nobody can argue that a provision of the constitution is unconstitutional. That cannot be able to stand side by side with section 42 of the constitution that talks about issue of discrimination. So you can't say a provision of the constitution if it has been added to the constitution, because it's unconstitutional because it is constitutional that serves as a basis of all powers and authorities in Nigeria. So I believe women should be given chances to at least uh, contribute their own quota to the development of Nigeria. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Um, we, we will go over to uh, Kano Network Center and uh, uh, Honorable Abubakar Sadiq Jallu, we're still talking about the question of women issues and would like to get your take on this matter. Uh, my, my, my take is that uh, women uh, play a very important role in our society and by virtue of their number and by virtue of the very important role they play as mothers, I think they should be given opportunities, they should be uh, given chances uh, to give their own uh, or to play their own part uh, towards the development of the society. Uh, most especially looking at their nature, they have this inbuilt uh, skill you know, for leadership. Uh, maybe that's the way God created them, looking at their anatomy, and I believe that's why they excel wherever they are uh, given opportunities. So I am in support of this. Uh, I can say I am a product of that because I believe out of the, about 30,000 people that voted me, mo almost 20,000 are women. So I, am, I will always be in support of whatever uh, we give them equality will be fair to women. This is my stand. Thank you so much. And uh, back here, there is also this other matter, which um, almost uh, became uh, a huge uh, controversy. And in fact, uh, when it started off, um, if I recall correct, correctly, it went to court. And that's uh, the matter of collection of value-added tax and such matters. And this also came up, uh, whether this should be the exclusive, should be on the exclusive list or otherwise. And um, I recall that um, it was made as well. So who said, look, there are so many provisions that have not really been tested. Uh, so what we are seeing now is this process that's going to take care of these issues. Well, the matter is still in court. Uh, the uh, move to uh, move that from the uh, uh, concurrent to the exclusive we didn't uh, I didn't sell to in the in the Senate you know but having said that uh, you know I think there are two or three states that are actually agitating who have actually gone to court to ensure that uh, mm -hmm. they be allowed to collect their own but the problem with that is that uh, once that happens then it's no longer but. There is not a single country in the world where VAT collection is decentralized. By its very nature, you can't decentralize it. Unless we are going to introduce sales tax in every state, what you have, I think, is a recipe for chaos, where everybody would be uh, applying his own VAT uh, across. So uh, when you have movement of goods and services uh, that pass through nine or ten states, then you have uh, VAT being applied uh, ten times. 
Uh, the wisdom behind the decentralization is that you have a central pool, uh, so you know you have VAT refunds, uh, where uh, you know the possibility uh, of multiple taxation is avoided because you have one central collecting authority. It will be interesting uh, to see how this will play out if the uh, Lagos and Rivers eventually get their uh, day in court, vis-a-vis -vis what the FIRS will now be. Uh, forced to do any blood collection. Well, like I said, you know, it, 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 I've, I've, I've not come across any situation where VAT uh, as a tax, value added tax uh, collection is decentralized. Well, uh, Minister, let's uh, come to you on that. Um, as a lawyer, and um, yes, uh, the matter has been taken to court. Uh, we're not <laughs> going into the details of that uh, action, uh, but uh, there were attempts to create a uh, make an amendment to amend that 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 that, that portion of it uh, yes uh, first of all is subject is since it's in the court for me to comment on it and then secondly the national assembly has decided to throw away the proposal for the for the amendment so for these two reasons i uh, wouldn't like to interfere and talk in that respect but however what i would like to say in respect of the issue of tax is that tax should be given some face of democracy. In other words, let the real productive benefit of the taxation be seen in entrenchment of robust development for the country. So no matter who collects, uh, so, what so, you, so what, no what matter who collects for my that, own that, worry is that the proceeds uh, yes, must go yes, to... Yes, preponderance you know. of what is collected mm -hmm. as tax ends up in private few pockets that is my own worry so we let developmental giant strides be entrenched with the money of the tax that is my concern the interest of an average common man okay and um just before we we leave off so many of those issues there's also still going back on the question of uh taking certain things off the exclusive list and someone said it's a uh, it's an attempt to decongest uh we look at the airports for instance uh, rail transportation um which uh, might be you know as the way they are now constituting a cog to uh, development yeah, absolutely and uh, uh you notice that uh, i think railways uh, airports prison services uh and i think power generation have all been moved to uh, uh, concurrently so that states can also be given a chance to participate. It was really, uh, uh, you know, a disincentive to have everything, uh, uh, you know, being controlled by the uh, federal government. I'll give you an example of power. A lot of states, especially in the north today, I think have the capacity to generate their own uh, power. My experience uh, uh, from Jigawa with solar power, you know, the fact that we had uh, six or seven solar power investors who are willing to uh, put in almost uh, 400 megawatts of power uh, in the state. You know, we finished our processes, we gave them land. Well, we spent three to four years uh, going back and forth at the Federal Ministry of Power uh, over issues relating to uh, uh, tariff agreements uh, and uh, uh, so on and so forth, uh, and and and, and the, the only reason uh, that happened is because uh, we did not have uh, the uh, uh, constitutional right, uh, so to say, the freedom to uh, really go it our own way and sell it, and uh, it's a disincentive. Uh, same thing with railways. Uh, you find that uh, you know right now railways are the exclusive preserve of the uh, federal government. With all the rail investment going on now. Uh, there are states that want uh, or have the capacity to uh, 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 have railways, uh, you know, but uh, the master plan by the federal government just said, you know, there's going to be a railway station in almost every state capital. You can have a situation where the state capital might not be the most, uh, 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 how would I say, the most uh, lucrative or uh, the most sensible place to have rail. So if states have the power to uh, do their own infrastructure, you know, you could just... Uh, uh, add it as you go along, since it's concurrent. Uh, same thing with prisons. Anything you do now, states are building airports all over the place. Once you finish, you still have to hand it over to the Federal Airport Authority to manage if you want to uh, uh, get uh, commercial flights to come in. So I think it's a good idea, and I think it will encourage uh, a lot of investment in these sectors. Uh, right. Let, let me go to Dr. Abdul Fatai Sambu uh, on this matter, particularly the question of uh, the prisons. And some Nigerians in the past have spoken against this to say it's ridiculous, isn't it, that um, the state courts 
would uh, convict a criminal and then they would be sent to a federal custodial center. And it, it, it doesn't really make sense. Whether it's federal or state custodial center, not the most part that that person has actually served in uh, your punishment. And you know, by virtue of the social of the constitution, nobody will be subjected to double jeopardy. If I've been uh, convicted, whether in uh, federal court or state court, no longer you have even served your, I mean, that person has served his or jail time, it doesn't affect anything. But I want to really commend uh, the National Assembly on this, which have actually been contested about uh, the six great items that we have in the exclusive. Uh, Stating this is too much, and uh, I think if some are taking to concurrence, and uh, this that, that that will be fine, just like uh, the students have said. But another thing that I thought you should have added uh, is uh, something that is done in some other countries where you have what we call a list that is exclusive to federal government, you also have a list that is exclusive to the states, then you have uh, concurrent list. In that, I mean, in that situation, it doesn't create too much confidence. People will not be going to court to challenge the exercise, the exercise of one right and the power of the, or the other. So we have some situation that will lead that will lead to less conflict because the state would have known areas in which they have exclusive power to operate. The federal government would have known the areas in which they have the exclusive power to, to operate, areas in which they can cooperate or have a concurrent because we cannot underestimate the importance of having concurrent peace. And one of the important one of the advantages of having the concurrent to allow states to develop at their own pace and it will, it will, it will also have a situation to lead to a situation where the national assembly will make law the states will now adopt these laws uh, later on like just like the admission of criminal justice uh, out of 2015 you discover that many states especially Lagos, you know you have so many states now adopting that particular piece of meditation that's the advantage of uh, and one of the advantages of having uh, yeah, okay, so. okay. All right. Okay. Um, I, I, as we wind down, we must uh, thank you, Dr. Abdul Fatai Sambu, Associate Professor at the Department of Public Law, University of Illori. Thank you for joining this conversation uh, on uh, NTA Tuesday Live about um, uh, alterations. You prefer to say alterations or amendment <laughs> to the Constitution. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us tonight. Thank you so much. Very thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Right. Um, I will quickly go to uh, Honorable Abubakar uh, Sadiq Jallo, Chairman, Committee on Judiciary, Jigawa State House of Assembly, who joined us from our Kano Center. Your final words as we as we uh, wind down this discussion? Down this discussion? Uh, my final words uh, will be... Uh, my final audience will be. Uh, oh, so we're winding down. We're beginning to have those audio issues. But uh, well, just to say thank you very much for being with us on this discussion. Um, we look forward to the next stage when these matters will come to the state legislature, and perhaps after that, we'll get your views once again. Thank you for being with us. Okay. And back here in the studio, Minasara Kugo Umar. Yes, um, uh, uh, regarding these uh, areas of concurrent, uh, uh, this uh, moving from exclusive to concurrent is a very good development, but I want to comment on only one because there is no time. The issue of the airports, we should be very, very careful. That is very serious. Uh, we should put into cognizance international security implications in allowing states to operate airports exclusively of the control of the federal. That is one. Secondly, there are so many areas I would like the National Assemblies to consider in the interest of developing our democracy further. Number one, consider the possibility of merging the two chambers of the National Assembly into one, reducing the number there 
and then clearly make it possible whether they are part-time or full-time VC. So that this issue of jumbo patches that you are taking uh, <laughs> over the interests of the nation will be arrested. That is one. Number two, issue of qualification for candidates. So that we will not be getting the type of people we are seeing, the dramatic personnel in the polity. Number three, it is very important you take decision regarding this issue. Anyway, <laughs> because of the All time, right. there are so many areas okay. really okay. desiring well, amendment that the National Assembly has not really put their touch yeah. light. Well, very sensitive areas that we we'll need to probably look into. We'll the probably issue of proliferation of political parties, we need limitation right. of that. <laughs> the, so many, so many independents, okay. uh, corrupt, uh, corruption uh, court, Rango, political you, offenses so court. We may revisit this matter. Yeah. 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 But yeah. let's get the in the comments. So, yeah, uh, so, in, in closing, right, I, mean, yeah. I, I just like to say that uh, you know, with, with, with what has happened in the Ninth Assembly, the, the, you know, the process of uh, amending the constitution is no longer shrouded in mystery. I think there's okay. a lot of transparency in the process, and uh, I think we should have a situation now where we don't need any special arrangement to have a constitutional uh, uh, amendment. You know, as we go along, as issues come up. Uh, let us uh, uh, focus on the uh, uh, lessons we have learned to create more flexibility uh, in the process so that uh, it can just be a dynamic and continuous process. As issues come up, you know, if it's a clash to the constitution, uh, we go through a process and uh, amend it. We don't have to wait till we accumulate uh, 70 or 80 bills and then have okay. the spotlight on the National Assembly. We, 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 it's lawmaking. It's just that, uh, you know, because it's a constitution, uh, we have to have uh, special uh, uh, arrangements and considerations. Thank you. All right. So we'd like to thank you for being part of the discussion tonight. We thank you very much for your time. So that's our program today. Uh, we also thank you for being part of it, those who called in, uh, those who also uh, aired their views on the subject matter. Next week, we'll be back with NT Tuesday Live. I'm Cyril Stober. Continue to stay safe. Thank <laughs> you.